Are we living on stolen land? Is Thanksgiving racist? Dr. Jeff Finn Paul, a historian who recently wrote a book about this subject, is here to dispel some myths that many young people today are learning about the history of the United States and the discovery of America. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Dr. Finn Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to join Relatable. Uh, I think I saw an email come across in my inbox uh, with your book title. Maybe someone pitched you for the show and we get a lot of pitches, but I came across this one and I was like, oh, I definitely want to talk to him. This is a fascinating subject for a book, Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World. So just go for it. Tell us, what is this book and why did you write it? Yeah, well, it all started several years ago when I kind of got uh, fed up was with what was going on in academia, and I said, it's time to find a way to celebrate indigenous cultures without also trashing Europe. So everybody's gotten into this weird binary where if you say something nice about indigenous people, you have to trash Europe. And I thought, why not do both? Let's tell a history where we can celebrate all of those great things about indigenous culture without making Europe look as bad as possible. Okay. So uh, tell us what, what is the truth then? Because let's go along with that narrative that I think that we hear a lot now. Um, I mean, as you know, we can't have Columbus Day anymore. It has to be Indigenous Peoples Day. And we have kind of um, heard in the past several years, that it is wrong to even say that there was a discovery of America, that it was um, exclusively the exploitation of indigenous people. We disrupted their very peaceful harmony that they lived in. We came and we brought disease. We brought violence. Yes, we brought technology, but it's been a net negative for the world that the United States was eventually established. Um, so what is the truth? Like, are we on stolen land? Is America completely illegitimate because of that? Well, that's just it. I think that the truth is that it's complicated. And that's really a big part of what I want to say in this book is things are never one sided. So, um, uh, yes, there were treaties that were broken. There were certainly massacres that were perpetrated by European Americans, but there were also many European Americans who dedicated their lives and careers to trying to ameliorate, to make better the lives of natives. Uh, and, you know, for many decades throughout our history, there were peaceful relations between the Europeans and the natives in a way that most people don't understand. Things like smallpox blankets, which everyone has heard of, it turns out that's almost a total fabrication. The numbers of natives who were massacred are far fewer than anybody would guess. So there's just so many fundamentals that, that nobody hears about anymore in the media. And I thought it was time to just bring some of those things back up to the surface. So smallpox blankets, I don't think actually everyone knows what that is. That is the idea that basically natives were purposely infected with smallpox? Yeah, well, it turns out that something like 90 or 95% of all the casualties in the New World were caused by disease, not, not by deliberate European massacres. But then what that means is a lot of people have tried to say, okay, well, maybe they did die of disease, but they, desired, they, they died because Europeans were intentionally spreading uh, disease through infected blankets and clothing. Well, it turns out that there is only one chronicled uh, 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 example of European Americans trying to spread disease through a smallpox blanket in all of American history, one time. And yet most students think that that's what happened every day. All right, quick pause to tell you guys about Naturally It's Clean. You are always asking me about the cleaning products that I use because I post about this periodically because I love Naturally It's Clean products. Um, these are fragrance-free 
a safer product for your family, for your pets, because they don't have a lot of those nasty chemicals, but they're really effective. I would not be using these products if they didn't actually work. I love the carpet cleaner. If you've got kids like I do, you know, the carpet gets messy a lot. She use the carpet cleaner a lot. Um, and it's really effective. You just spray it on there, sits on there for a couple minutes, and then you scrub it out. I mean, I've gotten out coffee and paint, all kinds of things with their carpet cleaner. I love their multi-surface cleaner and their stainless steel cleaner. Uh, They've also got laundry detergent, stain remover, all kinds of products, all made in the U.S. It's a company that supports our values and, again, is safer for your family and for your home. Go to naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. You'll see my essentials kit right there. You'll get 15% off your order, too, with code Allie. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie, code Allie. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie, code Allie. Do you attribute this kind of misunderstanding and this negative interpretation of, uh, uh, of, of this portion of history to the people's history of the United States, which is, you know, that left wing, I don't even know if I would call it a textbook, but it's kind of been used as a textbook in a lot of schools and a lot of colleges that a lot of uh, progressive students, they read and they realize, wow, the history of the United States has exclusively and unconditionally been oppression and, um, you know, discrimination and things like that. Do you attribute some of the myths that you bust in this book to that book? Yeah, you know, I mean, so Howard Zinn, that dates from the late 1970s, the mm-hmm. people's history. And I mean, the, the title says it all. It was intended as a Marxist rebuttal to the standard story of American history. Basically, Marxists on campus were angry that American history was making capitalism look too good. And so, yeah, unfortunately, with the rise of social media, I think Zinn's book has gotten more and more popular until almost everybody now is assuming that that is the standard history of America. When, of course, for many decades, most historians thought of Zinn as kind of a wild-eyed radical. Mm -hmm. But here we are, suddenly things have shifted so far to the left that he's being considered gospel. Right. And I I think that he has actually admitted in the past that it was more of a a narrative that he was or a point that he was trying to make that, look, this could be another perspective to offer exactly. to the history that we have accepted. It's not necessarily historical fact that he is relaying in all of the uh, different pages that he wrote. He is trying to make a particular point about the downside, as he would say, to capitalism and Western civilization. I mean, that's propaganda. It's propaganda it, um, is what it is. Exactly. Well, I mean, for many decades, you know, maybe people aired a little bit too much on the side of, um, you know, raw, raw versions of American history in the earlier 20th century. And so, sure, it was good for some people to come along and say, hey, this is a genuine critique. You could look at things this way. Mm. I have no problem with Noam Chomsky uh, coming up with critiques of American history and maybe making people think about things a little bit that they might not otherwise would have. However, it needs to be understood that these things are indeed radical critiques. These are meant to be fringe interpretations. They they make you think, but they're not supposed to replace the standard narrative about the Constitution, about George Washington and all that good stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about Christopher Columbus, because um, we hear that he was simply a mass murderer and that there is no reason to celebrate him at all. And so there should be. Um, no honoring. You shouldn't get off work. It's Indigenous Peoples Day. What's the truth about Christopher Columbus? Well, I mean, the main thing is, is the numbers that have been attributed to Columbus. I mean, there's websites now that are saying that 8 million people died on the island where he first landed, uh, Hispaniola, which is now Santo Domingo in Haiti. People were saying 8 million people died there, and it turns out that number was made up out of thin air by a couple of Berkeley professors in the 1970s, and almost no specialists have have agreed with it. Even Zinn says that that island maybe had 200,000 people on it instead of 8 million. So it turns out a recent genetic study has now found that, in fact, only about 40,000 people were living on that island. And that's almost the exact number which was counted by a Spanish census 50 years after the Spanish arrived. 
In other words, people were thinking that the island's population had dropped by nearly 8 million people, when in fact it now looks as if most of those people had simply interbred with the Spanish, and the Spanish had hardly killed any at all compared to what people used to think. So it's basically just exaggerated. You're not saying that he was a perfect person, that the whole arrival was, you know, rainbows, but it's been uh, hyperbolized over the years. Uh, and it's crazy how distorted the figures have been. And, and so you get the same thing with uh, Columbus and slavery. Yeah, after one war, he actually did load up a couple hundred people on the ship, but then the Spanish ransomed them and actually sent them back and forbade Columbus from doing that ever again. So, you know, the idea that he was this mass slaver and inaugurator of the Atlantic slave system is also greatly exaggerated. Uh, he was practically forced to do this by his creditors at one point. So in other words, things are much messier if you actually look into what's going on. Most of the myths we're being told in the news stories are, are again, mostly made up. Yeah, the truth is people are really complicated. The founders were complicated. A lot of American history uh, heroes that people on either the left or the right would admire are complicated. The truth is that yeah. they're not all you know, completely and totally virtuous. There are even things that Martin Luther King Jr., someone that we would all say did a lot of good that he said and did that I would not agree with, that I would not say is moral. But why do you think people are so reticent to simply rest in the fact that history is complicated? Historical figures are complicated. It's not just this nice and neat dichotomy of oppressed versus oppressor or black versus white or settler versus Native American. It's really messy. Why do you think people just resist that reality? Well, gosh, you know, I mean, there's something uh, called the Dakota 38, and this is held against Abraham Lincoln, where he ordered the execution of 38 uh, natives hmm. after an uprising in the Civil War. It turns out he had actually pardoned over 90% of the people who were originally supposed to be hung. So Lincoln is blamed for this when he actually pardoned most of them on human humanitarian grounds. So yes, this complication, we see it uh, all the time in history. And that's why using history as a sort of political stomping ground or a social media uh, stomping ground is, is usually wrong. Uh, but I'm afraid that since social media, people have really wanted to pick teams and they're trying to turn history into a sort of spectator sport where everything the other team does is bad, everything our team does is good. But as you say, if, if you look at it that way, well, pretty soon our students or our, our, our kids are going to grow up thinking that the entire world has been black and white. There's no gray areas. It makes it very difficult to compromise, for example. Okay, let me tell y'all about Birch Gold. It is time to diversify into gold with the help of Birch Gold Group. When you open a gold IRA for every $10,000 you spend by December 22nd, Birch Gold will send you a free gold bar. Just text Allie to 989-898 to claim eligibility before Black Friday. Birch Gold can help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a gold IRA for no money out of pocket and you still get the free gold bar. Bar. Text Allie to 989-898. Receive a free info kit on gold. No obligation. You can just learn more about it by texting Allie to 989-898. Allie to 989-898. Now, Thanksgiving specifically, there are even people who say Thanksgiving, the history of Thanksgiving is racist. And our thought of Thanksgiving as pilgrims and Native Americans coming together and sharing a feast, we hear that that's just all wrong. That in itself is propaganda. It really is yet another story of American colonial oppression. So what's the truth about Thanksgiving? Yeah, I know. I mean, so yes, it was whitewashed to uh, some degree in the 19th and early 20th century. It was a story told to school children. Again, very few of these were natives, and so it was told uh, to the majority of children. Um, but when you dig back in the history again, it's just as wrong to say that, uh, that this is totally racist or totally anti-Native American as it is to say that it was all flowers and, and wine. 
Um, so you go back and you see that there were truces made with native groups. Natives were intentionally coming to live with the pilgrims or near the pilgrims because they gave them lots of useful uh, things like metal tools, for example, mm -hmm. things that they really found useful. And one of the treaties with uh, the local Indian tribes lasted for 50 years after the first Thanksgiving. I mean, by most uh, by most uh, measures in world history, a 50 year truce is a pretty serious truce. And also the idea of Thanksgiving, native tribes actually celebrated a version of Thanksgiving themselves. And so it was originally celebrated in the 1620s as a way to bring both people together. So the idea that this was only about oppression or race or warfare has been greatly exaggerated. And there's actually a lot to celebrate if anyone wanted to find a positive reason to celebrate Thanksgiving. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that, about the, I know that you just mentioned a lot of the things that brought the two groups together, but is there any more about the relations between Native Americans and pilgrims that we may not know that we can look back and be thankful for? Yeah, well, you know, one thing is that people in the 17th century weren't really racist in the way that we think. So people in the 17th century thought that skin color depended on latitude, and so they expected to find people lighter skin further north and darker skin further south. So the concept of race didn't really exist. And we find that with Pocahontas and with many other uh, natives uh, in the early colonial period, we find Europeans trying to marry the daughters of Indian chiefs because they thought that this would make them noble. Mm. This would ennoble them. And remember in the 17th century in Europe, being a nobleman or noblewoman was the, the thing that everybody aspired to. Right. So they thought that by marrying, say, Pocahontas, who was the daughter of a chief, this would actually raise their social status. So again, the idea that people looked down on Native Americans or saw them as a group which should be you know, exterminated or something like that, actually, when you look at it, they were thinking, these people can actually raise my social status. The nobles of the Native Americans are higher status than most Europeans are. So that flies entirely in the face of the idea that these people were racist or exploitative. Right. They didn't have any concept of white supremacy. They might have thought no. these people are different, but they, you know, respected their nobility as nobility. They didn't see themselves as better just because of the melanin count that they had in their skin. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question that I have, because we hear this a lot. Well, actually, let me ask this first, and then I'll go into the reparations question. So the specifically the claim about stolen land that America lives on, or that we as Americans live on stolen land, and therefore we don't have any right to sovereignty. We don't have any right to close our borders. We don't have any right to call this ours, and we owe Native Americans reparations. We hear this phrase, land back. Okay, we should give them their land back, distribute all of our wealth and resources because this was their land to begin with. What do we do with a claim like that? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, we need to remember that for a very long time, and this is accepted by almost every mainstream historian, for a very long time, Europeans were not attempting to take over this continent at all. And even by the 1820s and 1830s, they barely had a foothold in North America. They only were living along the East Coast. Most of that land along the East Coast had actually been purchased over centuries of uh, slow development of a property market. For example, in Massachusetts, all through the 17th century, we see uh, Native Americans selling their land voluntarily to Europeans, often as their tribe uh, shrank in number due to disease because the Europeans offered them gunpowder, shirts, metal tools, things that they absolutely wanted. And the natives would often trade away scrub land that they no longer needed. So in fact, most of the land of the original 13 colonies was actually purchased in a land market, sometimes conquered in war, which could be seen as a violation of a treaty and was certainly legal by uh, what happened, uh, the, day, uh, the, the prospects of the time. Mm -hmm. And then most of the land, most of North America actually flipped from native control to European control over only 50 year period, right in the middle of the 19th century. 
So most generations of Americans who have lived before and after that, you know, they, they weren't even involved in theft of land in any stretch of the imagination. And then that, that middle period of the 19th century, we saw most of that land was held by hunter-gatherers who didn't really have a definite title to the land in the center of the United States anyway. There were often only two or 3,000 natives living in an area the size of a U.S. state, and they often roamed around. So these groups didn't really have any more claim to the land than anybody else did. Mm -hmm. um, and besides, by that point, hunting and gathering was gone for good because with the uh, introduction of firearms, people were going to have to settle down and farm, and they didn't need nearly as much land as they did for hunting and gathering. Mm. So you between must, all of these things, the idea of the the idea of stolen ground is is again an exaggeration and and very hard to justify using. Right, and I guess you could say in some way the entire world is basically stolen land. I mean, you could say that we've all been on the side of the conquered and the conquer at some point in our lineage, and we've all been in our lineage probably. Um, our ancestors have been on the side of the enslavers or the enslaved, the oppressed or the oppressors. As you said, history is very complicated. It's not this neat and clean binary. Okay, I absolutely love this company and what they do, and that is Public Square. You've probably seen them on social media, and a lot of people like me are promoting them, and that's because we really believe in the mis mission. This makes it really easy for you to support companies and services that actually align with our values. So if you're looking for a replacement diaper company, replacement clothing company, cleaning products, whatever it is, you want to switch away from the company that hates you and your values to a company that actually is fighting for the values that you believe in, then you need to use the Public Square app. It's spelled public SQ, but you say public square, and it will list businesses and services that you're looking for that support the things uh, that you support. And you can also list your business. So if you're a business owner, you want customers that align with your values, go to publicsq.com. Uh, download the app today. Just put in your location, your email address, and the businesses that you're looking for will come up. And again, you can list your business too. Go to publicsq.com or download the app today, publicsq.com. Is it true that the U.S. government killed buffalo in order to starve Native Americans? Yeah, this is another one of those rumors that, uh, you know, everybody has heard of and they think, oh, they're definitely guilty of this. Well, then you look at it and you realize that only about 10 percent of Native Americans were dependent on the buffalo when the Great Slaughter happened in the 1870s. So we're talking, you know, if we're trying to starve the Native Americans, that's a silly way to do it because only 10 percent of them are even going to be affected. Mm. Second of all, the real reason the buffalo were slaughtered is there were advances in firearms during the 1870s. So within a few year period, it became much easier to hunt buffalo. This actually took everyone by surprise. And the U.S. Congress actually passed a law against the slaughter of buffalo in the early 1870s. It got vetoed by Grant, but still the legislative will was there. Another thing people don't realize is about a quarter or a third of those buffalo who were killed in the Great Slaughter were actually killed by Native American hunters. Mm. So again, this whole thing, when you dig into it, it's astonishing how untrue it is. And about this issue of reparations for all of these injustices that people say have occurred, um, Native Americans, I mean, have received forms of reparations, right, throughout history? Yes, there's been lots of reparations going on uh, from the beginning, actually. I mean, even in, in the Trail of Tears, uh, most of the people affected were offered a farmstead and several hundred dollars cash, which was the equivalent of several years' salary. This would have set them up for life. Uh, so usually the U.S. government has been compensating uh all along, more than people realize. And there were forms of welfare that were adopted for various Native American groups already in the 19th century, long before the average American had it. Um, and to this day, we have agencies, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education, which are paying out money to Native Americans 
so that compared to African Americans, I think Native Americans are getting something like double the amount of money from the government per person as African Americans are today. So they're already today, you know, the most compensated minority group by a long shot. Yeah. Uh, but of course, nobody really wants you to know that. So it's pretty hard to find those figures online. Yeah. And, you know, last year, right before Thanksgiving, we had an author, Naomi Riley, on. I'm sure you've heard of her. And uh, mm -hmm. she wrote a book about the reality of these reservations that not only have they been given so many rep uh, reparations, but uh, also a lot of immunity from the law. There is uh, a different law, set of laws or set of policies that really protects a lot of these Native Americans that live on these reservations. And unfortunately, it hasn't led to freedom and prosperity for the people that live there. It's actually led to rampant, uh, rampant abuse. There's child abuse that is absolutely pervasive in many of these reservations because they are protected uh, in a different way. And that's an unfortunate form of so-called reparations that they really fought for. Um, but it's actually um, concluded in a lot of destruction and despair, especially for women and children on these reservations. So this to me is just another example of how social justice and left-wing revolutions have maybe good sounding stated intentions but end badly exactly it's not always the best thing you know they started um giving more freedom to individual reservations in the 1960s and 70s during the hippie movement basically and as you say uh kind of absolving people from normal federal laws and other laws that that have become standard well, I think that something like 70% of Native youth have admitted to never wearing a seatbelt, and they have the highest incidence of automobile accidents, of wow. fatalities of any group, of course. So, and also, you're right, in Canada, there's so many reservations where uh, violence against women has become uh, practically an epidemic. Um, and yet people are sort of, um, you know, they have immunity from normal laws, and it makes it a lot easier to get away with these things. Yep. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about the Conquistadors and Cortez. We That's another group that obviously we hear um, only about their violence. So what did the groups then, though, think of them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I wanted to bring in the Mexican angle because something like 50 percent of all natives in the New World were living in central Mexico. So mm -hmm. the reason why most Mexicans today are mixed race is because there were so many uh, natives living down there compared to uh, mm -hmm. up here. Interesting. We never and hear that so, Mexicans are living on stolen land. It's only Americans. <laughs> you know, and I mean, the, the Mexicans actually celebrate Columbus as sort of the, you know, one half of the father of the Mexican race, they, they call mm -hmm. it that day. And so, I mean, people still celebrate this. They realize they're mixed race and they realize that Europeans have something to offer. So this is a very North American liberal idea that we only should look down on Europeans. And the same thing happened in Mexican history. I mean, many Aztec tribes, the reason why Cortes could conquer the Aztec empire with 500 men is because he had 20 or 30,000 allies at his side. And they were all natives. So the people who didn't like the Aztecs, who the Aztecs were warring against, allied with Cortes. And so that's the reason why Cortes was able to conquer. Also, he had a, uh, a wife, a concubine Mar uh, Marina, and um, she was, was his voluntary lover and helped him to conquer the Aztec Empire. Uh, and so she actually played a pivotal role in his success. Um, and we see that the Spanish then come in and uh, their religion forbids the human sacrifice. So they think that even within uh, 10 years, the, the Spanish may have saved hundreds of thousands of sacrificial victims from, from being killed by the Aztecs. Uh, yeah. That's another one you never hear. And then the Spanish imposed peace across Mexico when all these tribes had been at each other's throats for centuries. Again, where's this bloody conquistador uh, story when you actually look at the facts? 
You know, that is a very uncomfortable part of colonial history is that that portion that you just talked about, the stopping the human sacrifice in the Aztec culture, that was also true throughout Africa when Christian colonizers, if you will, went there and with the order of the British Empire said, you can't do this anymore. You're not going to do child sacrifice. You're not going to do human sacrifice to your gods and witchcraft and things like that. I mean, you can call colonizing oppression, but the fact of the matter is, is that that saved tens of thousands of innocent lives by stopping the practice of human sacrifice in several countries across the world. Oh, and wherever they can, my colleagues will say, actually, they were only doing human sacrifice because European influence had somehow been there before the Europeans even arrived. Right. You know, so they'll concoct these crazy stories that they were only doing bad things because of European influence when... Everybody knows, you know, that that's a fable that's made up. But in uh, Mexico City, yeah, they had a skull wall which held 100,000 skulls, and skulls tend to fall apart after a couple of years. So those were all recent victims. So they know there's proof that that was going on in a, in a major way. Yeah, this is kind of more Howard Zinn romanticizing pre civilization. I see this a lot on the left, romanticizing time before civilization, before societies really existed, before the rule of law, before Westernism, pre-Christianity. They kind of romanticize, especially like Native American life as something that was just peaceful harmony, that they were at, they were one with the land. They respected the land. They respected the power of of nature and then the evil white man european came along and you know brought in capitalism and exploitation so is it true that before the settlers came that before columbus came that native americans were living in this beautiful harmony with each other and with nature yeah i mean that's another one of these wild myths that now everybody takes for granted but of course right up to the 1960s and 70s everyone including natives themselves realized that they were a very warlike culture the main thing in the 1950s and 60s that american culture celebrated about natives is what good warriors they were and then the you know the 70s hippie era comes along and suddenly the hippies want to rewrite native history as if they were always smoking peace pipes and they never went to war unless they absolutely had to but of course as in any tribal society when a chief only monopolizes violence in an area you know maybe 10 miles around that means there's going to be a lot of people living in close quarters and they're all going to be tempted to take over each other's land so warfare was absolutely a fact of life. Genocide was a fact of life. When you conquer a tribe, you try to wipe them out. You take all of their women and incorporate them into your tribe to basically erase them from history. And that was absolutely normative. And the idea that they lived in harmony with nature, uh, once again, the, I mean, we see when the first native peoples actually come into the new world in the Stone Age, they actually were responsible for killing off about 60 species of megafauna, all sorts of creatures, horses and buffalo and elephants and lions that used to live in the new world, but uh, they don't anymore. You know, so the idea that one group of people was more environmental than another group is, is silly. Everybody's been the same. Okay, if you are a business owner, listen up. I want to tell you about Net Suite. If you are falling behind in your business because of all of the manual work that it's taking, taking forever to close the books, uh, you need to make this process more efficient. And that is why NetSuite exists. You should know these three numbers. This is what NetSuite says. 36,025 one. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators in one efficient system and one source of truth. So manage risk, get reliable forecasts and improve margins. Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash Ally. NetSuite.com slash Ally to get your own key performance indicator checklist. NetSuite.com slash Ally. Mm -hmm. 
So let's fast forward a little bit to cultural sensitivity today, um, because something else that's shifted in the last few decades and I think has kind of accelerated in the last few years is this idea that we cannot use any part of Native American culture today. Like you can't be called the Indians and you certainly can't have like a depiction of a Native American alongside the word Indian. Um, you can't be called the Chiefs and uh, you can't be called anything if you're a sports team or whatever that pays homage to Native Americans because it's seen as cultural appropriation. Don't dress up as one uh, for Halloween. And so, I mean, is this, are we moving in the right direction there? It, I don't think so, but what do you think? Yeah, exactly. I think this is this really perfectly exposes the schizophrenia of the left in the United States because they're saying, you know, in on one hand they're saying you're erasing native culture, you're erasing native voices, you're not giving native people a uh, a proper representation in your histories. And then, you know, in the next breath, they'll say, wait, you're not allowed to dress as Indians. You're not allowed to, you know, use, uh, have any cars named after Indians. You can't have military things named after them. Can't even use the term Indian. And that says to me, that's, that's like a ridiculous PR move, actually, because Native Americans are famous the world over. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Native American, I mean, Europeans are using dream catchers and things like that. Everybody knows about Native Americans. But there's so many native groups around the world that nobody has ever heard of. And so in some ways, if you're a small minority group and you've had this outsized uh, effect on the world where almost everyone thinks of you in a positive way, why not go with that? I mean, that's something you could capitalize on in so many different ways in the modern world. But if we ban everything about Indians and natives in, in uh, America today, in about 20 years, Nobody will ever have heard of any of these legends. Nobody will heard of any of the good things about Native culture. Um, and, and so it seems to me ridiculous and short-sighted. Yeah, I think so, too. Is there anything else, any other myths that you want to bust or any other thing that you want people to remember going into Thanksgiving? Maybe they are sitting uh, across the table from their uh, progressive cousin who just graduated from Columbia and thinks that they know everything about American history and is protesting Thanksgiving because it's racist. Is there any tools that you would put in their toolkit? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the number one things is to remember that natives and Europeans were living side by side. They were intermarrying in a way that almost nobody understands today, just like they did in Mexico. And so, um, there has been much more peaceful interaction. There have been so many schools. Did you know that Harvard University opened a Native American college in the 1640s, right after it was founded? I mean, nobody knows this stuff. So there have been so many fertile cross-cultural pollinations, so many uh, ways that people have been getting along. And all you hear in the media today is that there was constant warfare, the people only hated each other. <clears throat> so our history is very much a history of an American melting pot in a very positive way if people would actually look at the facts. Yeah, I think so too. Well, thank you so much for being a historian that actually cares about history and is doing this work because I think it's important. I think it's important for our health as a country to be able to see things as they really were, um, which, as you said, is complicated, but not quite as uh, not quite as exaggerated and negative as people today would like us to think, who really have political goals behind their uh, negative interpretation of history, by the way. Exactly. Um, and I yeah, mean, I. Yeah, I think that we have to remember that the United States is still the greatest bulwark against authoritarian uh, evil in the world. We're the only ones who are even capable of being a global policeman. So if no, uh, if none of our young people believe in America, why are they going to want to fight and die for this country? We need to think of the big picture and what's actually keeping us safe and actually keeping human rights alive in the world. It's basically us and our military and our self-image is so integral to that. Mm, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I encourage people to go out and get your book, Not Stolen, The Truth About European Colonialism in the New World. Very necessary. Dr. Finn Paul, thank you so much. Thanks so much.
Okay, thanks so much for listening and watching. I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. We will have another episode tomorrow. A fun Q&A for you to listen to, but I hope everyone has a wonderful restful week. I did want to remind you, maybe a fun thing to do one night this week with your family is to watch The Blind. This is the amazing transformation and testimony of Phil Robertson. You know him from his Unashamed podcast on Blaze TV, also from Duck Dynasty. Uh, He and his wife have an incredible story. They uh, had a really rough and tumble start to their marriage. The life that he was leading was completely lost. I think he would say degenerate, but then Christ transformed him. And now, of course, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is an amazing minister of the gospel. So go watch that if you want to be encouraged. It's a really great movie. Go to blazetv.com slash the blind to purchase for $19.99. That's blazetv.com slash the blind for $19.99. All right, that's it for today. We'll be back here tomorrow. Mm-hmm.